my job was connecting writers to stories in Philadelphia, often related to history. And after I left, I still wanted to share the things that I found most interesting in the city with people who were curious. So I started doing these Philly history pop-ups around town. And this is sort of a version, a variation of one of those. And for me, it's about telling lesser known stories of familiar places and giving a little context about why they matter. And in conversation with Ellen and Linda Clark over the summer, we saw a parallel between my take on Philly history about seeing lesser known things and the idea of the burning bush, that something might be in front of you, but you don't, you might not pay attention to it. So this talk is called Philly Overlooked, and we'll look at Philadelphia historic sites through the lens of Jewish values. Um, and we'll keep coming back to that. So some of the places might, most of them don't have an overt connection to Judaism, but when you look deeper, there's some really cool ties. And you're welcome to ask questions as we go. So I'm gonna, oh, you bet, okay, so, all right. Well, I'm gonna focus on this. Maybe I'll give you a little note of when okay. to click. But anyway, so the very first one that we're gonna look at is the Liberty Bell. Do people know what the name Liberty Bell comes from? Why it's called that? I'm looking at Jerry because you always know. It comes from the, <laughs> biblical, the biblical inscription on the bell, which is from Leviticus 25.10, which says, proclaim liberty through all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. And the bell hung in the Pennsylvania State House Tower, which is now Independence Hall. And it was just a bell. It rang to track time and to signal emergencies until 1839 when abolitionists took note of the biblical inscription and they were the first to actually call it Liberty Bell. Um, the suffragists and civil rights leaders took, followed suit and they also used the bell symbolically in their fights for justice. And interestingly, the word liberty, and I'll pass these around, is enlarged on the bell. You can sort of see it there. And I've never seen any commentary on why that is, but it does remind me of the enlarged first and last letters of the Shema in the Torah. So what value does Jewish, does the Liberty Bell, what Jewish value does the Liberty Bell represent? To me, it's the first in Rhoda Shalom's vision statement, which is immersed in Jewish time. Because remember, the bell's original purpose was to mark time, and its later purpose was to be a symbol for multiple generations of women and men fighting for equality. So here, if you want to see that, you can. Um, the second one is guided by enduring values, um, which is this. And for that one, we'll look at the statue. Does anyone know where this, what this is? Liberty Place. Uh, no, not Liberty Place. It is this, Jerry, well, my go-to. It's in front of the Jewish Yeah. So yeah. Of yeah, exactly. Sorry, exactly. So that's exactly what it is. This is the Statue of Religious Liberty, and it is in front of the Weitzman National Museum of American Jewish History. Um, it depicts Lady Liberty holding her arm protectively over religious faith as a young person who's holding up a lamp towards heaven. And on the bottom, there's an eagle fighting a serpent, killing a serpent. And that suggests America's continuing struggle with intolerance. So the monument was commissioned by B'nai B'rith and dedicated to the people of the United States on Thanksgiving Day, 1876 at the Centennial Exposition, which was a huge world fair held in Fairmount Park in honor of the country's, country's 100th birthday. So it's a monument to religious liberty for all presented by Jews in the shaky days between the Civil War and the 20th century, and a perfect manifestation of being guided by enduring values. So I just think it's really interesting they use a word on there to describe Jews. They don't use Jews, they don't use Hebrews, it says Israelites, which is really, yeah. really, really rare. Yeah. To describe them. So it's too bad the trip to the Weizmann is to, isn't today, because the people could have checked that out on the way. Thank you, Jerry. Um, okay, so who better a beacon of compelled to moral action than Martin Luther King. And here he is speaking to a crowd of thousands at Girard College in August 
1965. And it's 11 years after Brown versus Board of Ed desegregated schools, I mean, which, which ruled segregation by race unconstitutional, but Gerard still won't accept black students. Adhering to the 1831 terms of admitting only poor white male orphans, um, which was actually progressive in its day, but not 130 years later. Um, it took till 1968 when Gerard finally admitted four African American students. Um, but there's another cool Dr. King in Philadelphia in 1965 twist, which is that he received a gift of $7,000 raised by 60 Jewish communal leaders at the Locust Club, where I know, yeah, lots of people here spent time for use for voter registration in Alabama and Mississippi. So very cool. I tried to find a news, I saw, saw it mentioned in a newspaper, but I couldn't find another image of it. Okay, and then um, Rhoda Shalom creates profound connections and so does <laughs> the lobby of the W Hotel which is a weird, a weird one, but it is a connection to the past. So the hotel's gorgeous lobby, and it's a shame because this one does look really beautiful on um, on big electronic our screen. Guy, our guy is here. Okay, so awesome, we, awesome. We, no we, problem. We, 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 uh, What's, this is the W Hotel at 15th and Chestnut. It's a newish hotel. Um, and the lobby is inspired by the sunken garden that was in front of Horticultural Hall during the 1876 Centennial Exposition that I mentioned a moment ago. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, it, was, it was a giant world's fair, um, which drew the Centennial, thank you, was a giant world's fair, which drew 10 million people to uh, Fairmount Park. And so I'm gonna show you, I'll pass around the picture but the central set, so what is in this picture here? The first one is a diorama of the Centennial Fair that had 230 buildings that's in the basement of the Please Touch Museum. And in that diorama, you can see in front of Porter Cultural Hall, like this little dash here, which is hard to see um, unless you're holding it up close, but that was the Sunken Garden. And here's a postcard of it. So Sunken Gardens were a Victorian era feature that were just a beautiful way to, just, to, to show gardens and they went out of fashion. And the designers of the lobby really looked to history to come up with something interesting. So that's why the lobby has this low sunken long area that has sort of a vegetation vibe. And there are these green banquettes that evoke hedges and this big tree-like canopy. So it, it is a weird thing, but if you're ever in this lobby, please soak up the profound connections to the past. Here, we'll start with you. Again. Okay, so those were the four RS values, the four, the, the four values of the Rhoda Sholem vision statement. Now we're going to go on to seven core Jewish values and I'll talk about places where if you look closely, again, you'll see they align with these Jewish values. Okay, so Sadaka, and thank you, Ellen, for, for sharing the list of values. This really helped build the presentation. So for Sadaka, we look to William Still. So Sadaka is righteousness, and it's defined as sharing resources to make the world more equitable. And that is a fitting description of William Still, who's the father of the Underground Railroad. We all know Harriet Tubman is the mother of the Underground Railroad, but, Har but William Still was the father. He helped nearly 1,000 enslaved Africans escape to freedom through Philadelphia. And people, I don't know, do people know his name? Do you know his name? Yeah, I, I hadn't until recently, fairly recently. He ran a complex network, including ship captains in the South, who would smuggle people onto their boats, businessmen who'd stow away people in hidden compartments of real trains. There were actually some trains on the Underground Railroad. And then a whole network of abolitionists and safe houses along the route north that would um, help people. And it went up as far as Canada. So he organized people moving on this network. In Philadelphia, he offered direct aid 
to those who had escaped slavery, including Harriet Tubman. And that is true, Sadaka, but there's more. He kept very bravely meticulous records about the freedom seekers, the conditions of their enslavement, details of their escape, and the secret workings of the Underground Railroad. And much of, and he published it in a self-published book in 1872, which is still the source of much of what we know about the Underground Railroad today, because it never wasn't something they were publishing or recording at the time. So he is clearly a William Still, a righteous man and a person of the book. Okay, next, a simcha. Okay, this one's fun. So a simcha is a joy or um, a, a celebration. And in Philadelphia, there is no greater celebration than winning a championship. <laughs> and this city's jubilation, though, comes with superstition. I think you all know the story of the curse of William Penn. That after, see, after um, this, ooh, oh gosh, this is uh, City Hall. And after Liberty Place went up in 1987, it broke the hundred year old gentleman's agreement that no building be taller than Billy Penn's had. So after they did that, no Philadelphia sports team won a championship for 25 years until <laughs> 2000. In 2007, <laughs> distracting. I'm muting. Yeah. Ten years later, when Concept Two went up and became the new public building, Bergman immediately put in another five on the top of that building, and the Eagles won the Super Bowl like that. Yeah. So we broke the curse. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. Now I don't even know where I am. <laughs> okay, I'll look at this. All right, thank you. All right, so that's the same. For the next one, where, who, how do I advance? Should still be on your computer. Okay. For the next one, um, uh, is Hashnasat or which is welcoming guests. And for this value, we looked. No. Oh, okay. Um, oh, sorry about the worst. Okay. Uh, welcoming guests. So we look to the Washington Avenue Pier, which for 42 years was the Washington Avenue Immigration Station, uh, which was the entry point for 1 million Europeans from every ethnic and religious group in the immigration wave of the 1880s to World War I. So the first 20 years of that wave, the majority of arrivals were from Western and Northern Europe, which is Irish, Welsh, English, German. But by 1896, it was more Southern and Eastern European, which is when Italians, Poles, ethnic Hungarians, or Magyars, Russians, and Jews began to arrive in great number. And the station itself, was a two-level building with customs and immigration, um, a currency exchange, a marriage altar for couples who needed to get married on the fly, which is something they didn't realize they'd originally need, um, and a ticket office for the Pennsylvania Railroad that was right across the station and you can it's across the street and you can see the um, train tracks. Um, now it's a beautifully landscaped park. Um, called Washington Avenue Pier, and hints of the original pier show through. The coolest feature in the bottom right corner is a climb on crow's nest sculpture by Jody Pinto called Land Buoy, which honors the pier's past as a port of entry. Um, and it conjures up the first, the, the, the vision that our great grandparents might have had coming to their new country. And that's my husband coming down the steps of it. So anyway, that's a beautiful place. And there's a lot of construction. It's right at Washington Avenue on the Delaware River 
you know, on Delaware Avenue. And there's a, um, there is a little sign and there's a lot of construction around there, but if you wanna walk down there, you can just be intrepid about following the, the little sign. Okay, the next Jewish value is Shalom Babait, maybe, which is uh, peace, the value of peace in our spiritual home. And this was a hard fought peace for black Christian worshipers in Philadelphia in the 18th century. This is the story of the founding of Mother Bethel. So in 1784, St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church at Fourth and Arch, which is still there, granted preaching licenses to Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. And it was the first granted to African-American pastors. St. George's allowed Reverends Allen and Jones to preach, but they had to do it at 5 a.m. to segregate black worshipers from the rest of the congregation. After multiple indignities, the two preachers and their followers left St. George's quietly but dramatically in the middle of services one morning. 10 years later, Richard Allen would purchase land at Sixth and Lombard, which is now said to be the oldest parcel of land in the United States, continuously owned by African Americans. And he'd start a congregation which would become Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is the founding church in that movement. Um, the building that we know of as Mother Bethel, which is on the top, is the third spiritual home, or Babai, in that congregation that the congregation has had on that site. And the one pictured below it is the second one. The first one, when they bought the land, when Alan bought the land, they moved a blacksmith shop over, and that was the first building on the property. So they've had that property for a long time. Okay, number 11. Next. Um, yes. Yeah. What's the uh, pastor's name? Of, of Mark a, Tyler. Uh, he, he's a fabulous. Phenomenal yeah. speaker. He, he's yeah. been here several, several times. He is he terrific. Is, yes. um, the next value is Kahila. Where did that go? Which is um, the importance of community. And that can be a social community or a geographical one. So Germantown, I don't know if you know this, but Germantown was the first permanent German-American settlement in America. It was founded by Franz Pastorius of Pastorius Park in Germantown um, and 13 Mennonite and Quaker families who were escaping religious persecution in Europe in 1683, which is one year after the founding, only one year after the founding of Philadelphia. Um, Pastorius named it Deutschstädtel, literally German town. And five years later, he and three others drafted the Germantown Quaker petition against slavery based on the Bible's golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Quaker petition of 1688 would become the first protest of slavery by a religious body in all the English colonies and a defining moment for this small community. Okay, the next is Bal Tashit, although I like to call it Bel Tashit in this case. <laughs> um, this is a Philadelphia, this Philadelphia historic item hits both. It means do not waste or do not destroy. So this is the Centennial Bell, which now is the one that rings from Independence Hall Tower where the Liberty Bell used to be. Um, until 1848. Uh, this centennial bell was commissioned in 1876 for the country's 100th birthday, an event we keep talking about. Um, it is a replica of the Liberty Bell, but much bigger. It weighs 13,000 pounds or 1,000 pounds for each of the 13 original states. Yeah, it's huge. And it has two biblical quotes on it. The original from Leviticus is around the bottom. And there's one from Luke on the top, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. But here's where the value kicks in. The centennial bell is made from melted cannons of both sides of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Literally, animosity melted down and recast into something better. 
So do not waste or do not destroy. Okay, yeah, isn't that a cool one? And that's the bell that we hear from the, you know, still on the hour from Independence Hall. Okay, so the next, yes. It's an unusual shape for a bell, that the flare at the bottom. Is there any explanation for that? I have no idea, but I, I have to tell you that a lot of the story, oh, we're so cute. A lot of the stories that you hear about bells start off with them not sounding good and getting sent back to the, the builder, the founder for recasting. So who knows, but it seems like that always happens. Um, I think it also just might be the angle that it's take, the photo is taken from. Um, Kiddushat Shabbat, the next value is the holiness of Shabbat or a sacred space, as Heschel put it, a cathedral in time. This is a center city site that makes me feel the elevation of place and time. It's the uh, children's discovery garden at the back of Sister Cities Park on the parkway next to the cathedral. It's a tiny refuge and a little moment of nature. It was designed as a mini version of the Wissahickon, the part in the back. Um, and it's meant for kids, but I've walked up that path, winding path many times. And if, right, I love it too. And if there are no kids, I may pop onto the net platform in, on the back um, or into the bird's nest. Oh, oh, there we go. That's the net platform in the back. And that's actually my friend, Abby, who's on here. <laughs> um, yeah, if you walk all the way around the back, you can find these features, uh, which were added later. And for whatever reason, that's not the bird's nest that's up there now. There's like a different one, but it's a charming little park um, that gives you a very different view of the Ben Franklin Parkway and literally feels like a cathedral in time. What's the name of this? It's called, the, it's called Sister Cities Park. That's the park. And there's a cafe there and there's a little fountain in the front. But if you walk through the kids area in the back, there's this little children's discovery garden. And it's charming. It's, it's kind of it for us from the big St. Peter's. Yeah. The Basilica. The Basilica. It's can directly behind the Basilica. Yeah. It's where Amor. It's right near the Amor statue. Yeah, that's such I mean, this whole talk is about the burning bush and hidden things you don't see in plain sight. I mean, I've watched, I had walked by that park. In fact, when they built the Barnes Foundation, when they moved the Barnes into Center City in 2012, that park was a crappy little pile of nothing, right? People remember there was nothing there. And, you know, I walked home from work by there all the time, and I would never even notice that there was like a spit of green there until when the Barnes opened, they revived that park because it's so close to the Barnes. And then they just keep making it better, but it's an ideal. Yeah, Jordan. Can you repeat for Margie where the location is in the garden again? Yeah, it's called Sister Cities Park, and the Children's Discovery Bar Garden is just the back end of it. And it's basically. I think a lot about it. Eighteen hundred. It's a bond. It's a question. Bond. Thanks. I have a terrible sense of direction, and sometimes people ask me on the street for directions, and I say I'm not from here. <laughs> Like, ask me the history of any place. Yeah, so 18th and Vine, yes. One of the sister cities is Tel Aviv. <laughs> well, here's the other thing, that, that the, there's a concrete, they have one of those quiet fountains in the front, and there's a, um, it's just like a concrete slab that has water that shoots up. But if you look on the ground, all the water spouts are connected to the 13, I think it is, Jerry, I don't remember how many, but the different city, sister cities that Philadelphia has relationships. And the length of the line and the height of the spout all have to do with how far the city is from Philadelphia and how big their population is. Oh, it's cool. super cool. It, it, it's, yeah, that, make, make a uh, visit there. Okay, the last one, the last Jewish value is Keva and Kavana, which are the Jewish dual, duality of the routine and the spontaneous. And I think of it as the fixed order of the prayer book, but also following the direction of your heart. And my first thought of a Philadelphia place to symbolize these values was the Franklin Institute and their walk through heart and climb on brain, which was added later. 
But I went more abstract with this one um, because the, the story of the light sculpture so ingeniously represents the framework of Keva with the intention of Kavanaugh. So uh, do people even know there's a light sculpture? Right. No. So it's in the top left corner and it only shows at night. Um, it's an eight foot LED light sculpture of a flame that evokes both the Statue of Liberty's torch and the Ner Tamid. So it's a perfect symbol for a Jew, for a museum whose mission is to interpret Jewish life in America. So they have this flame that flickers and the light you see in the flame is the 5,000 pages of the Talmud, each with their unique architecture, condensed down to graphic images that are projected in sequence through seven layers of LED and light emitters to give the impression of a flickering flame. So it is. So it's what is that? So this is the Jewish Museum. This is the facade of the White Tank. Right. Yeah. And and this, what you see here. I was fixed on the Franklin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are seven layers of these little white strips, and all 5,000 pages of the Talmud are condensed down and shot through that. And that is the epitome of hidden in plain sight, that the wisdom of the Talmud is quietly being projected out onto the street every night and pastors I don't even notice. Um, so that's, that is um, what I have. I, I hope that you've learned a little bit of the Oh, the audio is in the front. Oh, now my voice is clear. Phew. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry for the technical yeah, trouble, Zoom the, audience. Your voice is clear. Yeah, that's right. Um, but anyway, you know, the, the, and I will say that when Ellen and I were first talking about doing the session, you know, I wasn't sure if there was like a natural way to see Jewish values reflected in the world. You know, if something is overtly Jewish, that's one thing. But the more we started talking about it, the more there really are these little seeds of things that are kind of popped through. So um, thank, I thank you for listening. Thank you. No, I don't have a picture of it. I'll take you there on the way. Oh, the one, oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yes, yes. The lobby of the W, thank you, dad. Uh, okay, so there's the, Oh, this is way far behind, sorry. So the W Hotel, this, they, yeah, this is this lobby. You can see it's really interesting. And here's Horticultural Hall um, in the model. And by the way, if you want to go to the Please Touch Museum and see the Centennial model, which is basically like the size of, the model itself is the size of this part of the room. You can go, but because it's a kid's museum, you have to give your license at the door. Just, you know, they don't like people walking in there without right. kids. So you do that and then you're fine. And they have um, a little exhibition around it, but the model is fantastic. And it was the first thing, the first rendering I'd ever seen of the sunken garden. I'd heard it written about, but I hadn't seen pictures of it. And then oddly enough, and I should say, I'm not a historian. Again, I worked at Visit Philadelphia. I was in media relations. And so I'm very clear that like, I'm not a tour guide, I'm not a historian, but I just learned a lot about the city in all the years of trying to generate public, you know, press for it. And these are all things that I always thought were interesting because they made, a, it wasn't just like the, the superlative and the date and the, the time, the things that were interesting to me were, were what these sites meant in, you know, why they were made the way they were and some of the more, lesser known ideas about them. So I had never seen another rendering of the sunken garden until a friend said, oh yeah, I gave money to Hidden City and they sent me a pack of old postcards. You probably, yeah, I don't want them. Do you want them? And it was of the sunken garden. So, uh, so that's a postcard of it. It's, you know, wider than I would have expected. But anyway, I know, Ellen, how are we on time? We have five minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, it went just as we planned. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. you made the class work <laughs> under the difficult circumstances. <laughs> what an incredibly interesting presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much.
Um, all right. Any any other questions? We got? Yes. Andrew. The uh, Six Lombard AME Church. Yeah. That is the founding church of the whole movement. Of AME, yeah. yeah. No, the, and the, the yes, it was years after they had a practice there before I think AME started, which is African Methodist Episcopal, started in 1816. So they were there for a little while before they became that church. But when they celebrated in 2016 their bicentennial, the whole AME movement from around the country came to Philadelphia because that is the founding church. And remember, they were leaving from St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church, which is, you know, you don't pay attention. Like we think reform conservative orthodox. We don't think about all the names of the different churches, but they grew out of the the Methodist Episcopal Church. So they became African Methodist Episcopal. It was their own, you know, variation. And Absalom Jones had a different church. That's why they didn't start a church together when they left, because they were two pastors of different faiths. So anyway, long complicated story, but yeah, that is where the and I find it interesting that we have an Orthodox synagogue around the corner from Mother Bethel. Oh, at Mikvah Israel, yeah. 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 I mean, there, you know, this is William Penn's idea of religious tolerance. That's why so many church movements and synod and religious movement movements were founded here. There is a reason there are so many churches called First Reformed This, First Whatever That. Because it, it's again, it's not a coincidence. You weren't allowed to be in Puritan Massachusetts, and you know, different parts of the country weren't as welcoming uh, of different faiths as Philadelphia was. Yes, and the other hand, you mentioned Bethel. Does, anyone, yes. uh, it, does Bethel really mean Beth L? I don't know, but I would assume. Does I mean? Yeah, same word. So I'm getting nods. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're so interconnected. Yeah, Jerry. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that as a tour guide, I never knew, <coughs> I never knew about the Talmud Light from the museum, and I never knew about the Sunken Gardens. So thank you for thank you. everything. So just All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. It was pleasure. Thank mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, so the 11 o'clock session is upstairs in the community room and it's the five book, it's the musical session um, with the good technology up there. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's time for a quick break and then go upstairs.